Hey guys, it is Toto. Welcome back. This is my second video responding to Riley, this time discussing non-binary genders. If you haven't watched my last video responding to Riley, I suggest that you do, as I reference it quite a bit and I don't want to waste anyone's time by making all the same points in this video. As always, disclaimer, everything I say in here is simply my opinion. The only purpose for this is for open dialogue on these particular issues. That being said, let's get into it. Well, I already know a bunch of people are going to come to this video just to give it a thumbs down and leave a nasty comment without even watching it. So if you are one of those people, I would challenge you to actually try listening to what I have to say. Basically, non-binary genders are real, but plenty of people out there still believe that they're not. Someone who has a non-binary gender is neither strictly a binary man or a binary woman. They might be somewhere in between, their gender might be more fluid, or they might reject the concept of gender entirely. Non-binary people fall under the umbrella term trans, which refers to anyone whose gender doesn't match what they were assigned at birth. The opposite of of this is cis or cisgender, which would be someone who was assigned male at birth and identifies as a man. So when I use the term trans, I mean binary transgender people as well as non-binary people, really anyone who isn't cis. That right off the bat is one of the biggest problems I have with non-binary genders, is that they try to identify themselves as transgender. For me, non-binary does not equal transgender for a multitude of reasons. Many non-binary people say that they are either both male and female, a mixture, or neither. The latter, in particular, cannot logically be classified as transgender, as it is the absence of gender. Therefore, they're not really diverging from their original gender, they're rejecting the idea entirely. Another reason is simply down to the use of the prefix trans. Scientifically speaking, one of the biggest uses of the prefix is in chemistry and physics. In chemistry, for example, it's used to classify isomers, that is, chemicals that have the same formula but different structures. If two sets of the same atom are on the same side as one another, it is called cis, hence cisgendered. If the atoms are on opposite sides, it is called a trans isomer. Now you might say, aha, you've just proven my point. But here's the problem. In isomers, the atoms can only go one of two ways. In scientific context, these prefixes are only used for binaries. So trying to claim that anyone who isn't cis is trans is just not correct linguistically speaking. Those who undergo a sex reassignment surgery and go on hormones, however, do this term justice as they switch their features and mannerisms entirely from one sex to another. One more reason is that many individuals who are non-binary do not suffer from gender dysphoria but I'll get on to why I feel that's an issue a bit later on. One professor in Toronto recently refused to acknowledge any of his non-binary students by their proper names or pronouns. He said that when people deviate from the norm, they shouldn't be welcomed with open arms, but tolerated without too much aggression. The professor in question is Dr. Jordan Peterson. I personally think this man is amazing, and I'll have links to all his websites and social medias down below if you want to go and show him some love. This is a university professor basically saying, you're lucky that your gender doesn't make me aggressive towards you. Ew. If you actually looked into Jordan Peterson at all, you would find he holds no resentment towards true transgender individuals. In fact, I'm sure he's dealt with a lot of people with gender dysphoria and helped him as he works as a very proficient psychologist and therapist. What he takes issue with is non-binary genders, more specifically, the ridiculous pronouns they're trying to encroach on others. Because, through studies and research he's personally done, he feels that this sudden rise in non-binary people riding on the back of the transgender movement, as well as the rapid and unnatural change in speech that everyone is now expected to adhere to, could detriment society as well as cause psychological harm to the individuals who identify as such. I very much encourage you to listen to his talks and watch his videos, as he explains his position far better than I ever could. And those two are listed below if you are interested. So here are three steps to acknowledging the existence of non-binary people. Step number one, recognize that sex and gender are not the same thing. Sex is not gender. Gender is not sex. See, what I've always found interesting is that you, as well as much of the LGBT community, use the term assigned gender at birth, as you did previously in the video. Yet, we clearly make this distinction between sex and gender to try and validate non-binary identities. 
If this distinction is so clear, you must logically understand that when doctors look at you as an infant, all they're categorizing is your genitalia. They're recognizing your sex, not your gender. On top of that, because of this clear distinction, I don't understand the whole issue of needing to check male or female on official documentation. If you recognize that your gender can diverge from your sex, why is there an issue with recognizing your sex, even if it is different from your gender and saying so when required? But I digress. Sex is biological and has to do with your anatomy and physiology, though I've done an entire video on why this also isn't a perfect binary, which I'll link to in the description. My previous video is, in fact, responding to this particular one of Riley's. Go check it out if you're interested. Gender, on the other hand, is a socially constructed set of cultural norms. Even the Merriam-Webster Dictionary and the Oxford English Dictionary say that gender is more about cultural factors than biological ones. Gender, as much as you like to think it is, is not entirely socially constructed. I'll agree some of it is constructed, such as only women can wear makeup, boys like blue, arbitrary things of that nature. And let me make myself very clear. I believe that men should be allowed to wear skirts, dresses, and makeup without being judged. I think splitting up boys and girls toys is stupid. I think dressing up your baby girl in pink purely because she is a girl is stupid. In those sort of situations, in the socially constructed parts of gender, I think there could be a lot more overlap, because I don't believe those things should make you any less of a man or a woman. Some of my favorite people I've ever met are transvestites and drag queens who dress completely differently to their sex but are still proud of it. But the fact that such vast behavioral differences can be seen in other animals between males and females of the same species means that gender is not entirely constructed. Men behaving masculine and women behaving feminine is almost completely innate. And people can deviate from that or can behave more masculine or feminine, but that does not retract from the fact that men and women simply behave differently. Step number two, recognize that it's normal for gender and assigned sex not to match. So if we can agree that sex and gender are different, then we should be able to agree that your gender and the sex you were assigned at birth might not match according to what our societal norms would have you believe. As I said in my previous video, sex and gender almost always line up, making that the statistical norm. This is not to say that anyone who is transgender is wrong or should be treated as such, but the assertion that it is normal for your gender and your sex to match up is just intellectually dishonest based on statistical data. There is an infinite set of sexes and an infinite set of genders, and they can combine in any way. I've already discussed the idea of infinite sexes, check out my other video for clarification. There's nothing innate that would force people to identify with their assigned sex, especially because social and cultural norms for genders vary so widely from culture to culture. Yes, there is! Evolutionarily, it is very important to have the two sets of differing behaviors found in males and females. They serve different purposes and are vital to the species' survival. In species similar to humans, such as many ape species, the females are the nurturers and take a lot of the responsibility for care of the offspring, which is essential, obviously, for the survival of the young. Whereas males, while they do help with the childcare somewhat, are generally more aggressive, which is also incredibly important if another animal encroaches on the territory of the family group or if a predator appears. If there is such a threat, he needs to be ready to defend himself and his family. This occurs in both smaller apes who can live just as a single couple and offspring, as well as in large troops such as baboons. The only difference is the mating system. There are numerous reasons sex should correlate with the behaviors that they each express. It's estimated that there are about 1.4 million trans people in the U.S. alone. So there's no denying that there are some people who identify with a gender that's different from their assigned sex. Just a side note, I still really dislike it when you use the outlier population number rather than the overall statistics to try and make a point, as 1.4 million is still a minuscule percentage of the population. Of course, some people argue that being trans is just a mental illness, which allows them to pretend that trans identities are not valid. But this claim isn't based on any factual evidence. One study found that being trans isn't a mental illness because it doesn't inherently cause suffering. It's people's mistreatment of trans people that causes suffering. In my opinion, any legitimate transgender individual suffers from gender dysphoria. That's not an entirely popular opinion, 
but I truly believe having gender dysphoria is a prerequisite to being transgender. What reason would any person not suffering from gender dysphoria have to align with another gender or change their sex? There simply would be none. Of course, there are transvestites, but they generally have what is called gender euphoria. They hold no resentment towards their own gender or sex. They simply enjoy displaying the characteristics of the other sex, and there's nothing wrong with that. They may enjoy dressing up as a woman or a man, but reverting back to dressing and behaving as their true gender does not cause them any discomfort or suffering, as it does with gender dysphoria. Ask anyone who has or is suffering from gender dysphoria and they will tell you it is torture. Trying to claim that having this illness does not cause mental suffering is laughable. And I find it funny how later in the video you actually discuss gender dysphoria and describe it as And it's basically a feeling of distress or discomfort related to the gender you were assigned at birth. Yet you say that it does not cause mental suffering. Remember, being gay used to be considered a mental illness. It wasn't until 1973 that the American Psychiatric Association declassified homosexuality as a mental illness. But one of the biggest things that debunked that homosexuality is a mental illness was that we were able to identify the same behavior naturally occurring in many different species. Dolphins, grizzly bears, chimpanzees, penguins, bonobos, flamingos, the list goes on. But I have yet to see a study done on a female animal displaying all the behaviors of a male of the same species or vice versa. If such a study is to come out in future, I will seriously reevaluate my points and views. But the fact that we have yet to see this naturally occurring in species other than humans is a bit of a red flag that it's not simply a variation of human experience, as you claim. Step number three, recognize that people can identify outside of the binary. All right, this last step is admittedly the hardest for a lot of people. I've even met binary trans people who deny the existence of non-binary people. But the thing is, if you can recognize that gender is just this arbitrary social construct that's not based in biology, and you can recognize that people don't have to identify with the gender they were assigned at birth, then why can't they identify with a gender that's not strictly man or woman? There's no clear biological basis to our made up social concepts of masculinity and femininity. I agree. Someone doesn't have to identify as their birth sex, but as discussed before, gender, as well as masculine and feminine behaviors, are not entirely socially constructed. And so, this final step I'm afraid is where we disagree. Neuroscientific research even shows that there's no such thing as a male or female brain, and our brain biology exists on a spectrum. <sighs> I suppose you could say our brain biology exists on somewhat of a spectrum, but there are still quite large differences in human brains between the sexes, both structurally and hormonally, which dictates our different behaviors and even physiology. Now, because I'm lazy and can't really be fucked explaining, I'll insert a clip of Blair White, the queen, to explain this very eloquently. So male brains are about 10% larger than female brains. And no, that's not an indicator that men are smarter. Men also have about 7% more gray matter in the brain, and women have about 10% more white matter. In the cerebellum, men have more connections between hemispheres, which means an increased ability to translate perception into motor skill and ability, recognizing a threat and acting on it. Throughout evolution, males had to perform greater physical feats to defend the females and the children of the tribe, ensuring the survivability of its bloodline. In other words, men are more aggressive. In contrast, women have more connections across the frontal lobes, which translates to an increased empathy, social skills, and nurturing behaviors. These are essential to raising children, which women are wired for. Next, we have to look at hormones, which absolutely dictate certain behaviors and inclinations of the genders. Higher testosterone in the body, which males have, fuel behaviors such as competitiveness, higher sex drive, more aggression, and providing resources to attract potential mates. These behaviors make total sense when you take into account our evolutionary needs and psychology. Women, who have more estrogen, have the instinct to nurture, empathize, and make themselves physically attractive for potential mates. Think of why women, by and large, choose majors in college that involve helping others. Psychology, child development, sociology. This is a direct result of their instinct to nurture and help others. Of course, no two brains are exactly the same. But in the general population, there are a lot of differences in the brain biology of males and females. I'll drop a link to more info on this in the description. 
Gender isn't a static, constant thing that would always develop the same without socialization. Our concepts of gender change over time and between cultures, because it's literally something invented by, and then performed by, humans. And gender, at its basal form, can be seen in almost every species that has a male and a female. They display different behaviors. What we have yet to see is an animal other than humans naturally go against that programming. And it doesn't hurt you or inconvenience you in any way to respect someone else's self-identification. Now, here's the issue I hold with this. Many of these non-binary genders have, frankly, absurd names and pronouns. Each of these multitude of genders and pronouns were not born out of science, or even naturally evolving speech. They were born from academia. They are ideological. As such, people have the right to disagree with that ideology, and therefore, in my opinion, it is wrong to try and legislate or force someone to adhere to it. If you're still not convinced that non-binary genders are real, I genuinely want to know, what would it take for you to change your mind? Sincerely, if we were to do a behavioral study on a group of animals, perhaps a varying species, and we discovered that even a small percentage of them were going against their natural behaviors as a male or female, I would seriously begin to change my views. Trust me, I did research before this statement, and the only instance I've been able to find of this was of the maned lionesses they discovered in Africa, who grew manes and behaved as males. But the reason for this was that the alpha lion had either left the pride or died. And so, a high-ranking female took up this appearance in order to stop other prides from attacking or invading the territory. To me, this is simply a defense mechanism under extreme circumstances, not much different to a single mom who acts as both a mother and a father to a child. And I'm not talking about certain animals that are able to change their sex, either. Or even animals that have an overlap in physical characteristics. I'm talking a biological female who, by all accounts, should behave as such, behaving as a male, or vice versa. So, what's my final verdict? I don't really know. Of course, as I said, I remain open-minded for the future. But at the present time, I do believe in binary gender, and I very much believe in binary sex. The only one of these non-binary genders I could probably accept is asexual, as in neither gender, but even that's a bit difficult for me to intellectually grasp. Though of course, if someone does politely come up to me and asks me to use they them pronouns, I will oblige. But if you come up to me and demand that I call you them, I am much less likely to. Z and Z, however, probably not gonna happen unfortunately, no matter how nicely you ask me. So that's it for this video, I'll catch you guys in the next one.